Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the provincial COVID-19 update and media availability here in Surrey. I'm Dr. Victoria Lee. I'm the president and CEO of Fraser Health. I would like to first start by recognizing that we are conducting our business today on the unceded and traditional shared territories of the Keitsi, Semiamu, Kwatlen, Kukitlam, and Tuasin First Nations. I'm so pleased and honored to join Minister Dix and Dr. Henry for today's COVID-19 update. British Columbians have been applauded, not only nationally, but also internationally for our COVID-19 preparedness, response and recovery. Leadership from Minister Dix and Dr. Bonnie Henry has been integral to our pandemic response. Wave one has taught us that when we are united in our efforts, we can bend the curve. We need to work together again and stay strong to safeguard our loved ones, our communities and our health system. Fraser Health is BC's most populous health authority and serving 1.8 million people from Boston Bar to Burnaby. While Fraser Health represents a significant percentage of the total BC cases, we also know that COVID-19 knows no boundaries. That is why it is so important that everyone in every part of our province does their part. From what we are seeing, even small gatherings can be risky right now. At this crucial time, we're asking people who reside in the Fraser Health region to take a pause and reconsider our social interactions outside of our households. This is in addition to the uh, public health order doc Dr. Henry shared earlier this week. Ensure your safe six are always the same safe six. As much as possible, please socialize with people outside of your home, such as public outdoor spaces like parks or licensed COVID-19 safe businesses. If you need to bring someone home, please ensure that they are part of your safe six, the same six, and that you're able to visit in a COVID safe way. Fraser Health Family is made up of 30,000 staff, medical staff, and volunteers. Heroic efforts are made on an hourly, daily basis to protect the public. Some of the examples include effective case and contact tracing, which we've had 26,000 people to date, an expansion of testing and surgical services, and rapid deployment of patient-centered virtual care services. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all of the Fraser Health family, and I'd also like to thank Minister Dix, Dr. Henry, again for your support and for joining us this afternoon in Surrey. We have been the curve before and we can do it again. And now I'd like to invite Dr. Bonnie Henry to share today's provincial update. Thank you very much. And I appreciate very much being here today. Um, we are honored to be holding this briefing in the Fraser Health region. And I have often spoken about the importance of reaching out and showing support to those in our community in a safe way. We are here because in recent weeks, COVID-19 has been disproportionately affecting communities in the Fraser Valley. And we know that many people in this community are our essential workers who have kept our province going over this pandemic, whether it's in healthcare, in long-term care, schools, in agriculture, in our processing plants, all of the essential businesses that are here in the Fraser Valley have been carrying us through, through the last few months. And I'm here to show my support for the many, many people in Fraser Health who are working so hard to slow this pandemic down across British Columbia. So for today, we are reporting 234 new cases of COVID-19 in the province, including four of which are epidemiologically linked, bringing our total number of people with COVID-19 to 14,109. That includes 4,588 people in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 8,036 people in the Fraser Health Region, 256 people in Vancouver Island Health Region, 734 people in the Interior Health Region, and 406 people in the Northern Health Region. In addition, 89 people from outside of Canada. 
We uh, now have 2,344 active cases, of whom 86 people are in hospital, 24 of whom are in critical care or ICU. Sadly, we have one additional death to report today in the Fraser Health region. And the tragedy of this uh, death is one that I want to share with you because it is something that reminds us of how important the measures that we need to take are right now can be in protecting lives. This is a person in their 80s who attended a small uh, birthday party and uh, by small, less than 10 people were at this home and unfortunately somebody unknowingly brought COVID-19 and even though it was a small party in one person's home, the majority of people who were in that home became infected with COVID-19 and this person um, unfortunately ended up in hospital and dying from it. And I know her family and the care teams and the community mourn her as we do as well. It reminds us that this virus can't tell the difference and even a small gathering when this virus is circulating can be dangerous. We now have 5,714 people who are under active public health monitoring and 11,448 people who have recovered from COVID-19. Additionally, we have four new healthcare outbreaks to report at the Gateway Assisted Living for Seniors, the Mayfair Terrace Retirement Residence, Lakeview Care Centre and Louis Breyer Home and Hospital. And in three of the four cases, it's been a single healthcare worker that was identified early. And I think that is, again, a reflection of the important work that we're doing in public health and here in Fraser Health to make sure that we protect people in these high-risk environments. One outbreak in addition has been declared over at the Zion Park Manor leaving us with 25 active outbreaks in health care, uh, 24 in long-term care assisted living and one in acute care, um, affecting over 1,002 people, 567 residents and 435 staff. We have no new community outbreaks to report today, but a reminder that this virus continues to circulate and that we continue to see cases associated with businesses, with gyms, with other settings across the province. So for many of us, we know that fall is a time when many holidays and celebrations occur. We've had Thanksgiving already, and that tragically has led to an increase in the numbers of cases of COVID-19 that we're seeing. We also know that Halloween is coming this weekend. We have Diwali, we have Remembrance Day and other celebrations in the coming weeks. It is a time as well of cooler weather and increase in, in coughs and cold season. As well, more people are spending time indoors and we face the added challenge of having a pandemic of COVID-19 in our community now. Many of the new cases we have today are directly linked to gatherings in our homes and elsewhere that are now resulting in community transmission of COVID-19 across the province but this has been particularly the case in the Lower Mainland and the Fraser Health region. This Halloween weekend, we need to celebrate in new ways. We need to keep our groups small, particularly our, our own households in our homes and small if we're going out on the streets. We've talked before that we can celebrate in safe ways with our household and our families. If we are doing trick-or-treating, it needs to be small and it can be done safely outside with small groups, making sure that we give the others the space to safe, stay safe and also importantly to respect those homes that are choosing not to participate this year. We remind everyone that a province-wide order is now in place limiting the number of people who can visit in our homes. That means no Halloween parties this weekend. This is because many of the things we do at parties and celebrations, things like talking and hugging and eating and drinking together indoors, are much, much riskier, particularly now. And often they're with people that we care about and people we have not seen in a long time. And it's very challenging for us to resist that need to hold people close. Just as we want to keep our groups to no more than six when we go to restaurants, so we need to keep our groups small at home. 
If you are thinking about seeing people from your safe six, make sure it is the same group of six. And rather than getting together in someone's phone, home, choose to go to a location that has a comprehensive COVID-19 safety plans and precautions in place. And where we have seen people following those safety plans in restaurants and in other settings, we know that it works. It does prevent transmission of this virus. There are some very clear reasons for this. First, for most of us, our homes do not have the space for everybody to keep that safe distance that we need right now. Second, our, our homes don't have those layers of protection that we have built in to other places to slow the spread of COVID-19. We don't use such things as plexiglass barriers and one-way pathways in our homes, which naturally means that we will be closer to each other. And often in our homes, we are more familiar in our familiar settings. We may follow all of the precautions when we go out to a grocery store or when we're at school, but because we're at home, our awareness of following precautions is lower. And finally, while we may have the best of intentions to maintain our distance and use those layers of protection to support those around us, when we get together, especially if we have been separated, as many of us have for a while, it can be very hard to stay apart. And I know that as well as everybody. You know, seeing some of my colleagues here today, it's very tempting for us to, to want to get close, to want to um, hug each other or at least shake hands. And we can't do that right now. We have to stay apart and show we care. Even though we may think we are okay and that we have no symptoms at all, we know this virus can be transmitted. And it's those indoor settings when we're close, when we're talking to somebody, when we're sharing food, when we're in an environment where we let our guard down, that it can be transmitted. And it is transmitted to those who we are closest to. When this happens, it can have a very large ripple effect. And we're seeing that with the thousands of people now who are in isolation and particularly here in the Lower Mainland. So we're not just asking one or two people to self-isolate, we're asking thousands now, over 5,000 people. And that means they're not going to work, they're not going to school, they're not going to daycare, and unable to care for el elders and others who need that support. This is what we have to do now. These are the choices that we need to make today. We need to keep our group small, and I know that goes against many of our cultural norms. And it's not how we would normally spend some of these important celebrations together. But it is how we need to socialize now, at home and elsewhere. We need to do our part, and particularly this next few weeks, so that we can bend that curve back down across this province. We have seen the impact that has happened inadvertently when people have come together. And we now need to do our part to make sure that we are socializing with our immediate household only. And that we are in a household where there's multi-generational and large numbers of people, we should not be going out and doing some of those activities that are riskier, whether that's going to the gym, going to things like a spin class, or other situations where we might bring this home to our family. I also want to say that we, I know that most people in this province are doing the right thing. And we see that. We see that in the way that we're able to control this virus. And I want to thank people for doing that and encourage you. We need to do this together. And now is a critical time for us to pay attention again to how important it is to stand together by staying apart and to connect with each other in ways that are safe. And right now, um, we need to do that. We need to also be aware that when we're out in the environment that there is still this virus in our communities and we need to use all of our layers of protection and that means wearing masks when we're in indoor public spaces for the coming future. I also want to thank people for continuing to do it the way we have in British Columbia, for continuing to be kind to each other, to remain calm in the face of this storm and to be safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lee, Dr. Henry. And uh, I want to start uh, 
by acknowledging that the person who passed away who lives in the Fraser Health Authority from COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Henry spoke uh, uh, movingly, I think, about what happened, but we know uh, for family, for friends, for caregivers, for communities, this is a very difficult and challenging time to grieve. So we want and I want that family to know on behalf of the Premier, on behalf of everyone, that we are with them in these difficult times and we know how difficult that is. Indeed, I think part of the challenge in these times, part of the things that we've had to learn to do that we would never have wanted to do is to learn how to grieve together, to not uh, as much as we want to be close to people when really they need us to visit their homes. And the changing in the way that we celebrate life has been one of the hardest things, but it is especially now especially here, a necessary thing when we're dealing with these circumstances. But in this case, as in the case of all those who passed away, the 262 people who passed away from COVID-19 uh, since the beginning of this pandemic who've lost loved ones, I want to share my condolences and my thoughts. Uh, in uh, British Columbia today, there are 86 people in hospital from COVID-19. 46 of them are in the Fraser Health Authority. 39 are in the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority. One is in the Northern Health Authority. It reminds us, I think, and the case counts today remind us that while there's a focus of cases in Fraser Health, that there are cases all over British Columbia today and there will continue to be, and that different health authorities have different challenges. In Vancouver Coastal Health, there's actually a higher degree uh, of hospitalization today than even in Fraser Health, in spite of having significantly fewer cases than we've seen cases in Northern Health and communities flare up in communities but since the beginning of the pandemic. It tells us that COVID-19 is with us everywhere, and we have to deal with it everywhere. I want to acknowledge uh, that uh, we're here in Surrey today. We're here, first of all, to express uh, uh, gratitude and thanks to uh, Dr. Lee and her whole team of her team of 30,000 people in Fraser Health, her extraordinary team. About um, 70 meters from here, there is a whole group of people doing contact tracing where we are right now, doing extraordinary work to help people. Uh, right now, there are 5,714 people under public health surveillance, and that is uh, much of that the work of this extraordinary team of contact tracers. And in the last day, 10,129 COVID 19 tests have been performed. And that work, that work of public health, which is extraordinary, continues to have a profound effect, and we are grateful for everyone who's worked there. And we wanted to be also with the people of Fraser Health who are dealing with COVID-19 right now more than anyone else in British Columbia. And to say that um, we understand the challenges and we need all of you and everyone across BC to be together in this and to take the steps and to follow both the orders and the guidance that's been provided by Dr. Henry and her colleagues across British Columbia. With that in mind, I want to bring you um, up to date on the recruitment initiative for contact tracers, and it's very positive news. In the past week, 63 positions have been filled across health authorities. To date, there have been 523 total hires. Uh, this surpassed the initial contact tracing target, you'll recall, when this program was announced uh, um, uh, two months ago of 500, which was announced in August. There are a significant number of candidates also in the pipeline, so 523 total hires, 304 candidates in the interview stage, 78 candidates are in the offer stage. We, we now are intending to hire around 800 people in this process, more than the original 500 to continue to support the efforts of public health. What is moving about this as well is that 7,953 individuals express interest in these positions. And that demonstrates, I think, the desire of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in BC to be part of it, to help their friends, to help their neighbours, to be involved. I also want to note by Health Authority, that's 144 uh, hires in Vancouver Coastal Health, 181 in Fraser Health, 47 uh, in, on the, in uh, Vancouver Island, 19 in Interior Health, 16 in Northern Health, and 116 um, at the Provincial Health Services Authority. And the Provincial Health Services Authority, as you know, is the home of the BC Centre for Disease Control. I'd also note, because we're in Fraser Health, that uh, 34 contact tracers have been redeployed to Fraser Health from the PHSA in the last period. And the extraordinary work they're doing is much appreciated. I also wanted to bring you up to date on uh, our surgery renewal commitment and the work being done in our acute care hospitals and, and by uh, 
by uh, nurses, by health sciences professionals, by surgeons, by uh, HEU administrative staff, everyone to ensure, uh, and by cleaners to make sure that we are doing an unprecedented number of surgeries in our public health care system in the time of pandemic. Just to put this in context, for four consecutive weeks between September 14th until October the 11th, we were performing more than 7,000 surgeries a week, which is exceptional. In the week, um, uh, as reported last week from October 12th, to 18, uh, 5,920 surgeries were performed. That's the week that included Thanksgiving, so we were down a day. This week, the initial report is 6,925 surgeries, but usually that is uh, brought upward uh, in the report the following week when we get the final numbers. This is exceptional, uh, certainly above what has been done in previous years in the time of pandemic and reflects, I think, the extraordinary commitment of people in public health to uh, make up the backlog that happened when we had to cancel non-urgent elective surgeries in, in, in the middle of March through to the middle of May. And again, uh, that success, those actions, that activity is uh, made possible by what everyone does out there, by following uh, the public health orders and directions of Dr. Henry. We are all part of these successes. And the, and the value of this, talking to people who've received those surgeries, is immeasurable. It's something that we have done together and that we can continue together to do together if we do the work we need to do as a community. When we started out our BC pandemic response, we committed that throughout our response, until a cure was found, a vaccine was in place, until the threat was effectively ended, we would learn and we would adapt. And we have been doing that that we would be prepared to change methodology, practice, approach, guidance, orders, and supports, and that we do this to keep people healthy and safe, to protect our public health care system, yes, but to help people and to stop the spread. Learn, adapt, stop the spread. That has been the key to our collective and individual success. It will continue to be, and we should be prepared for that as we fight COVID-19 and continue to rebuild our province, our community, and all that holds us together. And with COVID-19 all around us, right where we live, right where we play, and right where we work, we committed to all communities and regions our full effort to step up, step in, and stop the spread. No place in BC goes it alone in a global pandemic. Every single community, every one of us, is part of the fight to stop the spread. Our commitment holds to keep people safe, to fight our effective BC fight against COVID-19. Every effort is made to stop the spread. Every support necessary to stop the spread is offered, and every action is taken where lives and safety are at risk. No community is immune to COVID-19. Rural, remote, indigenous, coastal, urban, suburban, yours, mine, ours. No community is immune. Every community warrants the attention, efforts, assistance, and support of the public health officer, medical health officers, and public health officials. And every community benefits from that support. We have to continue this together, and especially at this time, when the world, and we have seen it around the world, Germany and France and Ireland and the United Kingdom, the United States, Eastern Canada, is facing a second wave. We have to continue to do this work in British Columbia on behalf of friends, those that we love, and those that we don't know. Aujourd'hui, nous annonçons 234 nouveaux cas qui ont testé positif pour COVID-19 pour un total de 14 cas en Colombie-Britannique. Nous sommes attristés d'annoncer un nouveau décès lié au COVID-19 pour un total de 262 décès en Colombie-Britannique. Nous offrons nos condoléances à tous ceux qui ont perdu leurs proches pendant cette pandémie. Chaque régulation atteinte de COVID-19 uh, 4,588 se trouve à Vancouver Coastal, 8,036 à Fraser, 256 sur l'île de Vancouver, 734 dans l'intérieur et 406 au nord. Il y a aussi 89 cas de personnes qui vivent en dehors du Canada. Parmi l'ensemble des cas confirmés de COVID-19, 86 personnes sont actuellement hospitalisées, dont 24 en soins intensifs. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. We're happy to take your questions. Thank you, Minister Dix. As a reminder to everybody on the phone, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You are limited to one question and one follow-up only. Please also take your phones off mute. You will not be audible until your name is called. First question today is from Richard Zussman, Global News. 
Dr. Heather, I'd like to ask about positivity rate. Do we know what the positivity rate is in the Fraser Health region or more specifically Surrey? And is there a positivity rate for that region uh, that would have to be hit in order to start thinking about restrictions at schools in terms of closures? Yeah, so um, I don't have the number right in front of me, but we do post that um, on the rolling seven-day average. I think we have to be very careful about uh, single-day numbers and positivity rates because they fluctuate depending on when a test was done and how long it took to get to the lab, et cetera, et cetera. So as you know, we have quite um, high numbers of testing. We've been testing about 10,000 people a day, but that fluctuates during the week. So we do monitor it on a, what we tend to look at is the seven-day rolling average, um, and we uh, that's posted on the BCCDC dashboard every uh, afternoon, so you can look at it by region. We don't break it down by uh, city, for example, again, because uh, it it's more reflective of uh, the numbers and it's more stable a number when we uh, look at it from a regional uh, basis. In terms of, of you know, when we, we would take activities in schools, there are a number of measures that we look at. We look at whether uh, outbreaks are happening and whether there's transmission happening in schools. We look at uh, the rates of positivity, but also um, how they're connected. And you've heard me talk about this many times. So our percent positivity is one marker. Our rates of acute cases or active cases per 100,000 people um, over a week again or, uh, or an average daily rate over a week is something that we look at to help us understand risk in a community. As well, we look at uh, how many are unlinked cases. So those are things. There's no hard and fast number, but I can say when we look at the data from schools, which we do every day, uh, we have exposure events that reflect what we're seeing in our community. But we are not having um, a lot of transmission events in school. And as you know, we have one outbreak um, that we're managing that's in the interior health region so far. So um, we're not at a place where we need to consider things uh, in terms of closing schools. We are at a place where we need to focus our attention in the community to make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep those priority um, things open, like our schools and our businesses. So that's the action we need to take now is to focus on what we can do to reduce the rates in our community and protect those priority um, uh, important functions in our community that keep our community well because we know um, that schools are an important part of that. Richard, do you have a follow-up? I was just wondering about uh, burnout. I know you mentioned we're now increasing the number of contact tracers that are being hired no doubt to meet demand. One of the things we're also hearing from schools is that teachers are, are burning out due to stress, due to you know concerns about the virus. Some are staying home and, and that's putting an extra pressure on TOCs. Are you worried about teacher burnout and the impact that could have on the education system? You know, I, I think we are worried about all essential workers and the challenges that we're facing together around this virus. And we've seen it in healthcare workers, I see it in my colleagues, I see it in, uh, in teachers, in parents, the anxieties that we have about the effects this is going to have on our community, about long-term impacts. But and teachers are no different. They are dealing with these stresses as well, and we need to support each other to deal with these stresses. Whether you're a healthcare worker, a surgeon who's trying to catch up on people who've uh, had um, their surgeries delayed, whether you're working in a long-term care home where the intensity of the concern about the virus getting into a long-term care home, whether you're somebody who's working in one of our food processing plants or in a, in a grocery store with the essential service that keep our communities going. We are all facing these stresses and we all need to support each other. And how we do that best is by following the important things that keep us all safe. And right now, we need to focus on um, reducing our social contacts, making sure that uh, we are taking all of those measures to keep this virus from being transmitted in our community. And that's what's going to support all of us. Next question is from Shannon Patterson, CTV Vancouver. Oh, hi. Uh, Dr. Lee said that people in Fraser Health should reconsider 
having people over. What does that mean? Are you ordering people in Fraser Health not to have their stage six over, or is it just a recommendation? And if it's not an order, why not make it an order? Lots of other provinces have different regional restrictions based on where the high COVID numbers are. Yeah, so we have an approach here in British Columbia that we've taken together. There is the possibility of adding regional specific orders, but we know that most people are following the recommendations that we have. And it's very clear for people to see from the data. We know there's a lot of transmission in some communities more than others. And it's not limited to the Fraser Valley, but it is certainly uh, in the last weeks we've seen cases here. So this is a strong recommendation from myself and from Fraser Health that we need to pay attention to that in our communities here. And we know the communities, Fraser Health has worked with each individual community community. We know there are many um, people in the communities here who live in large multi-generational homes where transmission of this virus could be especially challenging. So we are asking people to pay attention to that, to understand the risk that is in your community and to take those measures that best protect you and your family and everybody in the community. I don't know if you want to add to that, Victoria. Okay. Shannon, do you have a follow-up? Um, families continue to raise worries about the mental and physical toll visitor restrictions are taking in seniors and care. Do you plan to make any changes to visiting rules in care homes? And if so, what might they be and when could that happen? Yes, and we have been working, as you know, uh, very closely with the seniors representative. We've been discussing the results of the survey that she did, and this has been top of mind for for many, many months for myself, for the minister, and for all of us at the in the health sector. And yes, we do intend to, uh, now that we are well around along the road of hiring additional staff to support long-term care homes, making sure that those measures are in place. We have uh, sufficient stores of personal protective equipment. Um, we will be in the coming weeks making some adjustments um, that, to support families and people who are living in care right now. And I don't know if you want to speak to that as well. Just to say, um, Shannon, that we'll be reporting next week on the progress in terms of uh, the hirings we're making of healthcare workers in long-term care. And the intent there, in part, is of course to uh, strengthen infection control, which is important, to ensure um, uh, staff is in place, which is important, but also uh, to create uh, the supports necessary to expand uh, visitation. It's an extraordinary effort, we, and we've had an extraordinary response in these times for people who want to be part of it, who want to be healthcare workers, and I see that as a very positive step. So we've already made uh, allocated money to care homes for some of that, and we're, uh, we'll have a detailed progress report on all of that uh, uh, next week. I know that uh, the seniors representative have done a survey. I expect at some point in the near future to receive uh, the results of those surveys and for those to make public. And I know both from my family's experience um, and from all of the people that I've talked to these many months who are struggling with the visitor restriction and long-term care, what it means to people. And uh, we're committed to making every effort to, uh, to try and increase the amount of visitation that takes place, understanding that uh, the risk care against other jurisdictions has been very good. We have to continue to be prudent to keep people safe, and we will be. Lauren Collins, Surrey Now Leader. Hi. Um, so, to be clear, we could see what is essentially a lockdown again in Fraser Health without it being a province-wide order. Can you speak on your thoughts on something like that with the numbers we're seeing now and the consideration that outdoor gatherings aren't as likely in the wet and cold weather? Yeah, so we have never had a, a, a lockdown as we know them from other jurisdictions in British Columbia, and nor do we intend to. Um, our plan, which we've worked on together across the province when we started our restart, was it goes in one way only, and that we need to learn about how do we live with this virus and reduce those settings when we know transmission is happening. So we addressed, uh, for example, when we were seeing transmission in, in nightclubs, and when we saw the transmission, we worked with industry, 
put in additional restrictions, but we were still seeing people getting together and breaking those rules. And it's very challenging for people to enforce those rules in places like banquet halls and, and nightclubs. So we issued an order to reduce those settings. Um, we had the same uh, idea when it happened in the, uh, in the summer when we started to see uh, parties and in vacation rentals. And so this order that I put in today is aligned with that. We have now started to see, particularly thanks, since Thanksgiving weekend in the last two weeks, uh, quite a dramatic rise in transmissions that were related to gatherings in people's homes. So we may have a, a wedding where part of the ceremony is in a church or a temple or a gudwara, and the, the rules are followed there, but then people go back to somebody's home and they aren't able to maintain those distances and people inadvertently spread it and we're seeing it being spread to hundreds of people through several events of that nature. Even small events, and I mentioned the tragedy of the, uh, the woman who died uh, this week in Fraser Health. It was a small event in a home where people inadvertently um, brought the virus in and the majority of the people in that event were infected. So now is a time where we need to pay attention to this. We know as we're going into cough and flu season that we're going to have more people who are sick and it's going to be challenging to know who has COVID and who has something else. And that we need all of us to think about not putting those um, expectations in place that people will come to our house for a celebration. We need to make it okay for us to stay apart safely through these coming months. And that is what we need to do to find our way through this stage of the pandemic in BC. We don't have any intent of closing down those important things in our community that keep our community strong and well. And that's things like having as many businesses as possible open with their COVID safety plans, having essential services open, continuing our, our surgery renewal in our health care system functioning as best it can and making sure that we keep our schools open for the health of our children. So that that's the philosophy. That's how we're moving through this pandemic and it has worked for us and we are looking to people in British Columbia to pay attention to that now because we, in, we are in a danger zone and we need to um, take these actions to make it okay if we're hosting to say no, um, to not invite those people were closest to, to put off the parties and celebrations to a time when it is safe. Lauren, do you have a follow-up? I do. Um, when it comes to messaging in Fraser Health, specifically Fraser Health, could um, there be better messaging? Some people have suggested the use of, to use the need for messaging in other languages, um, even in news conferences. When it comes to messaging, is there a point when you feel we should look beyond messaging and re revisit how these health orders and policies are being enforced? Uh, certainly enforcement's a part of it and uh, the fact that we put it under orders means that we are now able to use a broader um, group of people who are able to enforce and that includes uh, police officers and public safety uh, uh, provincial um, inspection officers from around the province. So that is one of the reasons why we do have the orders that we have in place. But we also know that we have ha not had to resort to enforcement for people to understand and, and follow the advice that we're giving. And that's really important. And I take your point about messages. We have been doing outreach to a number of different communities in the past week in particular, recognizing where people are being infected. And we have continued to do outreach to community leaders. And, and I really want to actually uh, appreciate the work that has been done by many of the faith leaders around this province. We have had a number of conversations, I think five or six calls with faith leaders from around the province about the importance um, when we're going through a crisis like these, the importance of having our faith community to support us in doing the right thing in keeping people safe and still being able to um, have that connection to our faith community. So uh, I do want to thank and express my gratitude to the many leaders and I'm looking to the community leaders as well to help us reinforce the importance right now of keeping our celebrations to the small and safe ones and keeping the larger celebrations of life or parties or um, other important um, memories uh, to a time when it's safe to do that. Next question is from Ashley Wadwani, Black Press. 
Hi. Um, Remembrance Day, as you mentioned, is around the corner, and that, of course, involves the honoring of veterans who are in the high-risk age group for the novel coronavirus, sorry, and obviously other respiratory and seasonal illnesses. Has there been any guidance given to legions for Remembrance Day, um, and what advice do you have for those looking to honor uh, those who have served if they shouldn't be visiting Remembrance Day events? Yes, and, and thank you for asking that. Remembrance Day is an important day for me as a person who served in the military, and my father did as well, and uh, grandparents. So uh, it is an important way of uh, commemorating those people who went through um, the many wars on our behalf. And yes, we have been in touch with the Legion here in the BC in the Yukon and uh, provided advice around guidance, and those guidelines are available on the BC CDC website, and we've provided some very specific guidelines. Uh, that the Legion uh, has been quite proactive in doing. So the, uh, for example, the Poppy campaigns will mostly be virtual this year, and I encourage people to uh, to purchase their Poppy online and to contribute uh, virtually. There are some that will still be uh, in, in some places, but it'll be um, at a distance and no touch uh, things put in place, so uh, there's provisions for that. Remembrance Day ceremonies will be smaller this year, and people will need to keep a distance, and we're encouraging particularly veterans or others who are more at risk to be able to participate virtually, and I know the Legion and others are looking at ways to support that happening. Um, and we are asking and have provided guidance that uh, the parties that are the the get-togethers that often occur after Remembrance Day ceremonies in legions and other facilities, that those be um, postponed this year. Ashley, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I do, thank you. Um, with weather getting colder, how should community groups and cities navigate addressing homeless populations um, when COVID and the need for physical distancing um, is, from what we hear, complicating uh, space for emergency shelters and obviously hindering the ability to add extra beds quickly. Yeah, and you know this was uh, unfortunately uh, an issue that we faced in March uh, when many, many of the uh, provisions were put in place. And and I know communities and municipalities have been working with with the health authorities and with um, the NGO groups and the, the the community groups to try and address this as best we can. It has been a challenge, as we know, this pandemic has also led to more people in need of housing. Um, there have been strategies that we've been supporting uh, uh, across the province, and uh, it, it's not a simple answer. Um, but yes, there is work being done to support additional spaces for shelters. There's recently some announcements uh, for money to support as well um, temporary housing and shelters uh, to be provided over the coming weeks and months. So there is a, I don't have all of the details for every community, but I know that this is something that has been worked on um, across the province and is a concern. I don't know, uh, Victoria, if you had any comments on that? Or... Okay. Next question is from Mike Hager, Globe and Mail. Hi, Dr. Henry and uh, Minister Dix. Thanks for taking the question. Uh, I heard from a family in the NIMO who was visited by a uh, Mountie uh, regarding a traffic incident, showed up on the doorstep without a mask and was about a foot away um, from a 78-year-old man uh, to discuss the incident. Uh, they were kind of shocked, wondering uh, what you make of RCMP in the province not having uh, mandatory masking guidelines for their members. It's up to the discretion of frontline officers. Um, is that sufficient? Um, well, we, we all know that the RCMP uh, has their own occupational health and safety workforce and they have um, national guidance that they uh, adhere to. We would expect that they would follow the similar guidance that we are providing to everybody in British Columbia, which means you need to have your, um, your layers of protection, which include being outside, um, maintaining a safe distance, and when you can't maintain those distances, that wearing a mask is appropriate, minimizing the amount of time that you come within uh, close proximity of somebody as well. So there are many different ways that we ensure that people are safe. Mike, do you have a follow-up? Yes, uh, I, I guess uh, 
paramedics and uh, the Vancouver Fire Service uh, require their members anytime they're responding to mask up uh, when they're dealing with um, patients or the public. Um, what do you make of that discrepancy? And just writ large, are first responders, are you seeing them in general um, getting infected on the job at worrying levels outside of long-term care and hospital situations? Yeah, so when we're talking about paramedics, we're talking and and fire response to medical calls, that's a very different scenario. They are dealing with people who are ill and they don't always know what uh, the cause of that illness is. So it is standard practice for pre-hospital assessment of people that uh, appropriate PPE is worn and uh, that is reflected in what we see with paramedics on the street and with fire who are responding um, to, to medical calls. So I can say that we have had very few. Um, our healthcare workers' um, infection rate is about a little less than 10% of all of our cases and that's across the board. I'm only aware of one paramedic um, and I know we have a number of firefighters who have tested positive for COVID but uh, the most recent it's because of uh, they were um, assisting with the wildfires down in in California and we've had a, a number of them who've come back and uh, been infected whilst they were uh, working in California. So it is a, a, it's a negligible amount and I'm not aware of any firefighters or um, police who have been infected in uh, the course of their duties on medical calls here in BC. Rob Monroe, Info News. Uh, hi, Dr. Henry. Thank you for this. Uh, you did mention uh, last week and today about the outbreak in Kelowna. The Rob, we lost you. Can you try again? Okay, we'll come back to Rob. We'll move on to Mary Griffin, Tech News. What? Sorry, Rob is back online. Please don't. Hello? Okay, we can hear you now. Rob, your line is open, please go. Okay, uh, I was talking about the Okanagan Men Center, their outbreak here. Uh, could you, Dr. Henry, elaborate a bit more about how many people are affected and what is going on in that situation? Uh, my understanding is that, that uh, there are a number of staff who were uh, infected, uh, that uh, there's no uh, concerns about residents at the moment, and that all of the um, people who have been in close contact have been identified and have been mon and are being monitored. Do you have a follow-up, Rob? Yes, in a slightly different area. The Okanagan was the site of a bunch of parties in the summer and uh, you brought in orders and restrictions. Now it seems to be parties at issue in the Fraser House. But there's quite a spread right now in the Okanagan, Central Okanagan with um, schools. There's an outbreak in one of the schools, some cases in other schools, and daycares that have voluntarily shut down. There's one at Okanagan uh, Men's Center. Do you have any idea of how this is spreading in this region compared to how house parties in, in the lower mainland or is it the same kind of spread here? Yeah, so one of the things we have learned over the last 10 months around this virus is that once it, it's now a community spread virus. So it's being spread between people and mostly in small clusters. It doesn't spread in the same way that we see with influenza where it sort of goes through a whole population and everybody gets sick at once and then it sort of passes through. It's really about clusters of cases and most people don't pass it on to anybody or at most to one person that they're in a household contact with or a close contact with. But some people we know spread to more and it's the situations um, that we create that allow that to happen. So whether it's, um, you know, we've heard uh, stories uh, both in Ontario but also here about things like spin classes where they're in an enclosed environment, people are working very hard, somebody who doesn't realize they're ill is spreading virus and other people are breathing it in and become sick. So we are seeing those types of clusters. We're also seeing clusters where people have people over and um, somebody may come from the lower mainland and visit somebody in Kelowna. Um, this is one of the scenarios that's happened up there. Um, people uh, in Kelowna unwittingly become exposed 
exposed, um, become ill, and by the time that it's recognized, uh, they've had an exposure event in their workplace, which might be a, um, a school or a long-term care home. So that is how it's being transmitted. The work that we've been doing in contact tracing, we, we trace that back and we can link almost all cases. Um, we have a very steady low number of cases that we can't link and that's one of the things that we follow very carefully to make sure that we're not seeing um, widespread uh, transmission that's that's not associated with some of these events. So it's it's kind of the, the neat work that we do in public health, the disease tracing and uh, disease detectives we call people, but trying to make sure we know how it's moving through our populations and I can say that that, that is the case in, in, from what we know in Kelowna that it is people who've come in um, from other places or who've traveled or who've met family members or have had close contact with somebody who has had the disease and has brought it back and it's spread in a limited way within their community with the people that they've had close contact with. And that's why um, the orders that we are putting in place are the same across the province because we know people go to celebrations of life or go to have weddings or birthdays. Um, with family members and friends in other places in the province and they bring that risk back with them. And so the settings that that can happen are the same everywhere. It's more a risk right now in areas where there's more virus, but it is still a risk everywhere. Next question is from Rob Buffum, CTV Vancouver Island. Oh, hi, Dr. Henry. Thanks for taking my question. The um, opinion that represents grocery store workers across the province is calling on you to elevate your messaging from the other day uh, where you said, you know, now the expectation is that people will wear masks indoors in places like grocery stores to a provincial order. I guess my question is, what's your reaction to their request for that? Um, and if you would not, would you consider elevating it to a provincial order? And if not, why not? Yeah, so we have talked about masks and other other personal behaviors that are an important tool as part of the the group of things or the layers of protection that we have. So we have not mandated that you must maintain a, a, a safe distance from people. We've not mandated those types of activities because they all work together and we all need to have them together and most people are doing the right thing. Where I'm, I'm paying a particular focus on masks now is because we are seeing increased transmission, particularly in some areas of this province, and that extra layer of protection in addition to the other things that we're doing, um, our, our hierarchy of control, so minimizing the time that we spend, minimizing the number of people in, a, in a, an environment like a grocery store, making sure that we're not stopping and talking closely to somebody, um, wearing a mask. Um, those are all important steps that we all need to take all the time and reinforcing that. The other thing that is important that works very effectively is barriers. So we have two parts to this. In the grocery stores and other retail stores, every uh, business needs to have their COVID safety plan. And for those types of businesses, we know as well that WorkSafe BC has guidance that protects workers. So we need to make sure that workers as well um, have access to personal protective equipment, are wearing masks where it's appropriate, are maintaining their safe distance, making sure they have barriers in place, that we adhere to the things that we had in place that we started in March and we all learned learned how to do, which was, you know, having one-way markers in the grocery store, reducing the number of people commensurate to the size of the, of the facility so that you're not getting crowding and enclosed spaces. So all of those things work together and uh, I will reinforce with people in, um, in grocery stores and other retail places. Uh, I've also heard from people who work in uh, hardware stores and other places that both staff and people who are using those uh, those facilities and retail places should be using all of the layers of protection and that includes wearing a mask when you can't maintain those distances. Rob, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I'm just wondering if, if we don't see people complying with, you know, with this expectation, if we might see it turned into an order. At some point I was at a grocery store today where I interviewed three people who, none of whom were wearing masks but they said, if it, and then I've just been saying this, but they said if it was mandatory, they would be wearing them. I'm wondering if you can articulate for me um, if there might be some appeal at some point to making it mandatory. You know, I... 
there's no evidence that I've seen that making it mandatory is going to change the mind of those very small number of people who have a mindset against wearing a mask. So that's not the approach we're taking. Uh, we are continuing to take the approach that this is one tool in addition to the other ones that we have that help keep us safe. And I know that most people understand that and appreciate that and are doing the right thing. And that's important. Um, and we have seen very good compliance. And I also want to say that, you know, we have not been seeing transmission um, in grocery stores when people are doing the other things that are important as well, like maintaining space, um, minimizing the time in the store. And I will also bring up, because it is important, there are some people who cannot wear a mask. Is it very few? There are very few medical conditions, but they are very real. And we are not going to be requiring people to carry a medical note or anything like that. We trust people who have those conditions, um, that they are, take other measures to make sure that they're doing what they can to protect others and protect themselves. And that may mean um, ordering out and picking up your groceries rather than going shopping in a grocery store. So there are other things that we can do to support people um, who have a, a reason for not wearing a mask. But no, we are not intending to make this mandatory. It is a human behavior that we want to support and we know that most people are supportive of and we want to encourage and support everybody to do the right thing. Keith Baldry, Global News. Hi, Dr. Henry. Thanks for this. Um, just on contact tracing, we've gone from 500 contact tracers to approaching 800. Just wondering what the reason for that is. Is, is it because contact tracing is proving to be more onerous or we're finding more contacts that have to be traced and therefore more people uh, have to be involved in this? And also a clarification, you referenced uh, filing a new, public, a new health order today. Is that a new one or is that the one from a few days ago? Uh, the, the health order is the one from Monday, <laughs> so yeah, no, no new ones today. Um, in terms of contact tracers, that's additional people. So I do want to say that the, the contact tracing is work we do in public health all the time. And we have pulled in all of our public health resources, whether it's public health nurses, our medical health officers, um, environmental health officers from across the province who do this work. We do it for other reportable communicable diseases. Um, now we've been focusing our attention, of course, on, on our part in controlling COVID-19 in, in BC. Uh, we've pulled in uh, people who work in health authorities, even uh, speech pathologists and others. But that also means there is other important work that they are not doing, like our childhood immunization programs and uh, restaurant inspections. And, and that's important. We have a balance. But right now, the focus is on making sure we're controlling this pandemic. And so these additional uh, five to 800 people are going to supplement the people who have been doing this work all along. So it is a combination of, yes, we need more people because, as you can see, we're up to about 5,000 people now who we need to um, support to self-isolate because they've been in contact with somebody with COVID-19. We also do that work of, of finding where people became infected and supporting people. Most of our cases are people who are at home and they um, can get quite sick at home and may need to go into hospital, may need to have um, advice about their care. And that is the important work that we do to connect with them every day and answer those questions, make sure they get the care they need when they need it. So it is a very, um, it, it, it's a job that um, requires a, a, a skill set that our public health workers from all across the health sector have um, and we need to, to support them and supplement them because we need more of that right now. We also need to continue with things like our influenza immunization program which is important through the coming months. So it's a little bit of both. Do you have a follow-up, Keith? Yes, yeah, just a, a, in terms of people in isolation uh, being monitored, was, was that anticipated? It just strikes me 5,000 is obviously a lot of people. Was this part of the sort of forecast? in terms of where we thought we were headed? <laughs> I, I don't know. There's a good question. You know, I, I would have liked if we could have forecast that we actually our curve went down and we had less people. Um, 
it, it is a reflection of some of the, the transmission events that have happened. So uh, I presented it at one of our modeling sessions or a couple of our modeling sessions. In the first phase of our pandemic, uh, when we didn't have a lot of restrictions in place, we were getting people who had um, sometimes hundreds of contacts and that made it very challenging. When we put restrictions in place in March and during that period of time until the restart, uh, the number of contacts people were having were much, much smaller, so one or two, which meant we could stop those chains of transmission very quickly. We're now in a phase, and, and we sort of went up and down through the summer, but we're now in a phase where in the last couple of weeks, we have seen that number of contacts people have had go up quite dramatically. And so that has put a strain on our ability to find people quickly and to stop those chains of transmission. Um, so it, it has been um, an evolution, and now I'm calling on people to take that step back to stop those environments where we can transmit the virus to a larger number of people because that helps our contact tracing. It also means that we're not passing this virus on to many more people. We have time for one more question this afternoon. For everyone listening, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix will release a statement later this afternoon with the latest information on cases, hospitalizations, and outbreaks, which you can find at news.gov.bc.ca for medical guidance on protecting families and communities and for access to provincial guidance on COVID-19, visit bccdc.ca and for information about the province's pandemic supports, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. Last question today is from Joel Ballard, CBC. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for staying for this whole uh, conference. Uh, this question is actually for Dr. Lee. Um, there remains some confusion about how people in the Fraser Health region should treat their safe sick. You seem to indicate earlier this week that there were separate rules for people living in the Fraser Health region and that even safe sick people should not be invited into homes. It seems you've backed off that today. Can you tell us why? Thank you for that question. Uh, I think it's a clarification because uh, we've said that you should not have your even your safe six in your private home to have parties and events and celebrations. Now, we are also asking everybody that uh, because even small gatherings can be risky, even with your safe six, to really take a pause reconsider whether it's necessary to have people over in your home. And if it is necessary to have that visit with a small number of people. So I think that's the nuance that we wanted to clarify today because we saw some of the uh, information that go out earlier that seemed to misinterpret some of the uh, guidance that we provided in terms of the recommendations. Joel, do you have a follow up? Uh, yes, please. Um, this one will be for Dr. Henry, and if I could ask for Minister Dix to um, answer in French as well, that would be helpful. Um, would you consider increasing the number of public briefings each week in BC, given the increase in the number of cases in the province, much like how Ontario has daily COVID-19 briefings? Uh, <laughs> I guess I could probably answer that in French too. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> The uh, uh, no, you know we're in a we're in a we have daily statements that come out that uh, provide important information about the the progression of the pandemic here in BC. Uh, we have uh, been at uh, two briefings a week, and that has uh, answered most of the questions. We've exhausted many of the questions most days. Um, we also have uh, outreach that we're doing on other days to different groups uh, around the province, and and we also have work to do. <laughs> in between times. So I, I think we're at a good place right now. I was actually looking to move to perhaps one day a week uh, of a media availability, but we're, we're staying steady where we are right now, given uh, the situation that we're in. Oui, pour ma part, je suis d'accord, bien entendu, avec de, le Dr. Henry. Uh, C'est uh, uh, deux, me paraît, uh, le bon nombre actuellement, uh, on, uh, on va faire le lundi et le jeudi. Je pense qu'on a bien sûr uh, une déclaration à l'écrit 
euh, les, les autres jours et je, je pense que là, ça marche. Euh, il faut se reconnaître aussi que euh, Dr. Henry est, toujours, est, est souvent sur euh, la télévision, sur la radio, dans, euh, dans, des, dans des antennes un peu partout dans la province. Euh, Moi-même aussi, le Dr. Lee aussi. Donc, je pense qu'il y a beaucoup d'opportunités pour des gens de, de, de comprendre, euh, comprendre, comprendre ce que euh, nous voulons communiquer. Donc, je pense que ça va continuer à être deux. Et on, on va voir euh, à, à l'avenir, mais euh, on va rester toujours disponible euh, à la fois aux médias et euh, au grand public, public, bien entendu. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. And, uh, and until Monday. Thank you, everyone.